Hello everyone, happy Sunday. My name is Keisha and welcome back to another episode of Delight. Today I'm going to be doing away with a little bit of perfectionism. I'm recording with a front facing camera today instead of setting up a different spot. Um, I'm also going to try to be just like a little less with the editing <laughs> and more real and raw. So if you hear any loud vehicles or anything, hopefully that doesn't just deter a lot from the video or take away a lot from the video. But yeah, I'm happy to be spending a little bit of my Sunday afternoon with you all. This has been such a weird last couple of weeks. I am actually filming this just the day before you're seeing it, which is not the norm for me. I thought that on my off weeks of delight, I would be filming then, but I have just had a little bit of a crazy schedule. Maybe I did that to myself, but nonetheless, I'm here. So this is going to be one of those scenarios where I am a little bit rusty probably, but I just wanted to spend some of my Sunday with you all. Um, and I'm going to try to dissect a little bit of what the Lord has been doing in my life and then share a little bit about just something I want to share, but I know that the Holy Spirit is going to speak through too. So it's not something that necessarily I've been learning anew, but something I feel like I could use a refresher on and maybe you could too. So to get started, I do want to mention that I did just finish up this book called Help for the Hungry Soul by Kristen Weatherell. And how I got turned on to this book was actually from this book. So you may have heard me talk about Memorizing Scripture by Glenna Marshall. I read this at the end of last year and it really, really positively impacted me. I have quite a few highlights throughout, especially at the beginning, and I just really loved what she had to say about memorizing scripture. Now, this may be a book that just from the title you look at and you think, wow, I do not want to read that. I don't care that it's short. Memorizing scripture just sounds like such a chore and not something that I really want to get into because maybe you're trying to get out of having a checklist faith. Maybe you don't want to think about all the things you feel like you need to do or should do, and you don't want this to like influence that. But as someone who struggles with some of those same things, I will tell you that this book is nothing like what I expected it to be, and it really did transform my life. I almost feel like I need to do a reread of it this year, which I probably will do at some point, and maybe I will be doing it with all of you. If any of you participate in Revive, I'm thinking about bringing this back at the end of next year. Not the end of next year, the end of this year. But I just feel like this was such an impactful book for me. And this actually led me to Kristen Weatherill. Glenna and Kristen, along with another author, did a seminar. I think it was last month that I attended. And they were just talking about hungering for the Word of God, which is what this book is about. It is eight encouragements to grow your appetite for God's Word. And so Kristen really talks about that we just were born with this appetite. From the moment that we were bo born from our mother's womb, we have an appetite. And we were born with this appetite that can only be satisfied and quenched by the Word of God. And I just found that this book was really good for like a basic beginner Christian. I did glean something from it. Most of it was from chapter two. I wouldn't say this is like a new all-time favorite um, Christian nonfiction book, but I do think that a lot of people would really enjoy it. So I would recommend it. But I really wanted to share a little bit of chapter two with you all. This chapter is called Plead for a Holy Hunger. And in this chapter, Kristen starts relating our relationship with God to that of a relationship of a child with their mother or just relating us to children in general, which we know that the Bible does do that. Um, we are called to be childlike and there is a reason for that. But she starts talking about how in order for, for God's spirit to work through his words, we need to actually engage with those words, which I know can be intimidating. You all have probably heard me talk plenty about getting in the word of God lately, but that is because that's something that you know, it seems repetitive, but it's one of those things that you have to get ingrained in you. Something I'm trying to ingrain in myself and trying to be obedient with. And so if I bring it up a lot, it's because that is where I'm at. And I think repetition and ruminating is going to help with that. So further along in here, she talks about why we plead and that it's because we're helpless. She says, we are dependent on the redeemer of our hearts to change our very desires, to give us the ability to want what we ought to want and to love what he loves. We are helpless to produce this change on our own. Day by day, we need him to alter our appetite. And then she talks about how our helplessness actually humbles us. And this is something else I'm going to talk about in a little bit, but we'll get to that with the help. Helplessness hungers us. Helplessness humbles us. Then she quotes Jeremy Pierre's words, children don't try to be important to Jesus. That hit me. Children don't try to be important to Jesus. And that's exactly why he welcomes them. To be near to God, you cannot bring anything to impress him or to make you special in his eyes. 
You're not special to God because of your obedience to him. You are special to God because of his heart towards you. The Lord loves to show mercy to those who, who know they need it. And children are very good at knowing their need. That was such a revelation to me. Like, I feel like it's something I should know, but it was just so good to hear. Because how often do we sit here and beat ourselves up about what we're not doing? We feel like we need to do all these things because the Bible says we will have fruit of the Spirit. But you can't force that. It comes naturally through the inner workings of the Holy Spirit. She moves on to say, For too many years, this was the way I approached Scripture. Because I didn't understand my neediness. I thought that by opening, the, my, opening my Bible, I was seeking something good and right to do rather than primarily seeking someone to love. But humility is the pathway to satisfied hunger, for it confesses its inability to find satisfaction anywhere else but in God. And our merciful God prom promises to answer the cry of the humble, helpless heart. Isaiah 66 two says, But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. I was also reminded at this moment of another scripture that my friend Lauren had shared with me not too long before this, and it's Isaiah 57, 15. So let me turn to that in my Bible. It may take me a second to get there. Let's see, Isaiah 57, 15. If you wanna flip with me, this is a great opportunity for you to do that, like we're in church and you're having to flip in your Bible. So I won't cut this out just in case you're flipping with me, but let's see, what did I say, Isaiah 57? 15, I think is what I said. This is a lot easier if you can just do it on your phone, but I don't have that luxury right now because that's where I'm recording. Okay, so it says, let's see. Oh, wait, it wasn't that. What was it? Hold on. It is Isaiah 57, 15. Did I get this right? Yeah, okay. So it says, for this is what the high and exalted one says. He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. And that just, oh, it's so good because it speaks to what the Lord is doing in my life right now and maybe what he's doing in yours. And that brings me to something else. I'm going to kind of like veer a little bit everywhere today, but I'm hoping that something that I say here today will hit you, but that kind of reminds me of like how God connects things in your life sometimes. That is one of my favorite things about the Lord, and I think it's a very special way that He speaks to me, and I don't know if He's ever spoken to you that way before, if He just connects random things to speak to you, but I think it's such a wonderful thing, and I encourage you to pray for it if you feel like you haven't experienced it before. But essentially what I'm saying is with that book, I was reminded of a scripture that Lauren had shared with me. And then through other things, I was reminded. So example, I was supposed to read this book this month because I had it on my TBR and I was not sure about it. I had never really done anything with this author before, but I started reading at the beginning of this book. And in my last delight episode, what I was talking about started being present in this book, just like in the introduction and everything. There was a, what is this? The Forward by Janie Ortland. And she said, Kristen understands the wonder it is to go from hindred to hopeful, from dulled to delighted, from picky to passionate. She calls this wonder the miracle of loving God's word. And she guides us in how to bring our fussy hearts to our kind king for him to work that miracle in us. Help for the Hungry Soul is an enticing invitation to every one of us to slow down and feast on the bread of life. If you tuned in to my last delight episode, I talked a little bit about this. So I think that is so funny. And there were other things in the beginning chapter that she talked about that I was like, wow, I feel like I just mentioned some of this in my last delight episode. So to me, that was God saying, hey, there's something in here for you. There's something important. And I feel like a lot of what I got was what I just shared with you. And sometimes that's all it takes. Sometimes we don't have to enjoy a whole book. Sometimes we don't have to agree with the whole book or a whole person's beliefs. But there's something there that God can speak to you. And that was that for me. And in what I just read in this book, I'm going to try to find a scripture that was really speaking to me. It's in the Psalms. And I'm wondering if I shouldn't just start reading through the Psalms because the Psalms has really been speaking to me lately. <laughs> the Lord has been speaking to me through the Psalms. And there is one Psalm and it is Psalm 107.9 that was mentioned in this book and that I really feel like, I feel like the Lord has been highlighting this to me. And it says, for he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. And I love that. I love that. And going along with that, 
there's another psalm that's a little bit longer and it talks about um, the word when you read the word and the importance of the word. I know I highlighted it. I just have to find it. Give me a second. Okay, I knew I highlighted it in my Bible, so I felt like that was an easier way to bring it. So it's gonna be in Psalm 19, and it's Psalm 19, verses seven through nine. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. I'm going to continue reading this. It says, They are more precious than gold, than, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So in this and before this, I guess I should have read the whole Psalm because before that part, the beginning of the Psalm says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. And then it goes into the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing for the soul. So creation tells us much about God, but his word tells us even more. I actually studied that a little bit. I wanted to read on some commentary because I thought maybe these were different things because it was using different words, but a lot of it just means the same things. And it's just that the Lord speaks to us through his word, refreshes our soul, gives us joy and peace and knowledge and wisdom and all those lovely things. So the reason I'm bringing that up um, is because I was looking for my next Crossway book that I was going to get because I am a part of their influencer program. And there was one book that was really speaking to me and I'll pop it up here on the screen because I can't remember the title at the moment. And I was between a few different books. I knew I'd heard good things about this one and it just felt like something I needed to focus on because it's a little bit more of a focus on other people and speaking to other people. And so What's so funny is sometimes when I get on Crossway and I look at the books, I'll go ahead and preview the first chapter. The first chapter had that Psalm 19, those exact verses about the law of the Lord being perfect, refreshing to the soul and everything was there. And I was like, okay, God, I see you. So that's the book that I got. So I just love how he does that because I feel like there's going to be something there for me, something that he's trying to teach me or grow me in or show me. So I just love how God works. He loves us so dearly and he really does, I truly believe, he really does speak to us in ways that are unique to us. Not that he doesn't speak to anybody else the same, but he knows you. And we're all unique humans. We're all unique people. We all have our things that we love um, and our different ways of communicating. And he knows your love language. He knows what makes you tick and what makes you joyful. He knows all of those things. And so I love that he speaks our language to us too. And that's just one thing that is just wonderful. And I, I don't know, I really want to talk about the love of God because that is something that sometimes I feel like we just miss. And sometimes I think we are just dull to it. I have definitely been there. And I think that we are constantly uncovering different levels of God's love for us because I'm probably going to end up sharing the gospel here, but God loves us so much. Um, I have a quote that I wrote down some time ago that Chris Valentin said. He said, you were saved when you believed in Jesus, but you were transformed when you realized that he believed in you. The love of God truly does transform our lives. You don't have to do things for Jesus to accept you either. You know, sometimes, again, we talk about this a lot here. I talk about this a lot here. We think that because we're Christians that we have to live by this rule book. But the Bible is not a rule book. It is a guide for your life. Yes, there are things that are beneficial and things that are not. There are things we should and we shouldn't do, but that's not our motivation. We're motivated by the love that we receive from the Lord to be obedient to him. Also, I apologize. I think that they're about to mow our lawn. So if you can hear that and it, <laughs> it gets in this video, I'm so sorry. But 
it's so important for you to know that you don't have to do anything for Jesus to accept you and for Jesus to love you. The cross does not create your value. It reveals it. So I want to talk a little bit about salvation today. I want to talk a little bit about the gospel. And I know that you've probably already heard this before, but maybe this is a different way to hear it. Maybe you need to be reminded of it. Maybe this is the first time you've heard it. But I want to talk about salvation. And this is something that I'm so passionate about because I grew up in the Bible Belt. I grew up in a place where you hear a lot of hellfire and brimstone preachers. You have a lot of scare tactics where people tell you, hey, you need to get saved so you can get a ticket out of the bad place and into the good place. Because for some reason, we try to focus on the then after, the thereafter. We try to focus on after this life and that we get to go to heaven and that that's what the whole point is. We need to get saved so we can go to the good place. But friend, that is not what salvation is all about. You don't have to wait for heaven because when you meet Jesus, heaven comes inside of you. You see, we live in a broken and fallen world. Back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve committed the first sin, that is what broke our relationship with God. So salvation is not about heaven. It's about restoring you to your created purpose. It is about restoring you to your original self by reestablishing connection to God and finding wholeness in Him. I don't know if you realize this, but you really can find wholeness in the Lord. Sometimes it is in this life, sometimes it is in the next, but He is the only one that can satisfy you. He is the only one who can restore you to completion. Acts 3, 8 tells the story of Philip. And when he was restored, let me read to you what his reaction was. Now, I did misspeak. It's not Philip, but Philip is in Acts also. But this is the story of where Peter heals a lame beggar. It's in Acts chapter 3, and it says, One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So I love this story because I love how it says, when he went into the temple courts, he was walking and jumping and praising God. This man experienced complete healing, physical, emotional healing, all of it. And this is called in the Greek, sozo, physical, emotional, spiritual healing in completion. And this is what the Lord offers you. Just look at Adam and Eve before sin. In essence, they were pretty perfect. They did not have sin in the world and they had fellowship with God. They walked and lived with God. They had relationship with God. This was their created purpose. Now, some people say, well, okay, if God loves us so much, and if God wanted this relationship with us, then why did he put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden? Now, you all, if you don't know this, I really hope that you do. You should know it. Love is not forceful. Love is kind and gracious, and love does not force things upon you, force relationships upon you. So God put the tree, in my opinion, this is what I've gleaned from this, and I've heard different things spoken to. Um, God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden to give man a choice. And I think that's really important for us to remember that God gives us free will. He gives us a choice. He doesn't force relationship with him on us, even though that is what we were created for and our life would be so much better with him in it, but he does give us a choice. And unfortunately, Satan came into the picture, the serpent, the enemy came in and he distracted us. He said, Hey, let me give you this thing. Let me offer you this thing. Don't you know that you will be like God? But see, Satan tempts you with things that you already have. The Bible tells us that we were made in the image of God. Now, in case you don't already know this, Satan is a fallen angel. He was the worship leader in heaven, and he had this desire to be like God or be greater than God. And so that is why he was cast out of heaven. 
and he attacks you and me. He attacks us because he hates our position and our authority that we have been given through being created in the image of God, having relationship with God, that he's given us this authority and Satan can't stand it. So what he does, he can't create, but he can manipulate things. So a lot of things in our day-to-day life may look like God, but they may be manipulated because Satan can't create on his own. Satan can only distort what God has created to make it evil. Backtracking to being in the Garden of Eden. So when Adam and Eve committed the first sin, God can't be in the presence of sin. He could not be there with them. And so he sent Adam and Eve out of the garden. That was then evidence of our broken relationship with God. But here's the thing. God spent the whole Bible and our whole lives trying to restore us to that right relationship with him because he loves us so much. So at first he starts in Exodus by giving us the law. His standards for righteousness or right standing with God or being right before God is to abide by 613 laws plus 10 commandments. And the thing is, if you break one law, then you break them all. This is evident in James chapter 2 verse 10, which if I can flip there quickly. James chapter 2 verse 10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. So obviously, our sin nature changed when Adam and Eve fell from righteous to sinful. So we're trying to be restored. We could not fulfill the law in our sin nature. We could not abide by. So God sent Jesus. He sent Jesus to walk out the law perfectly for us. Jesus earns our righteousness. God sends Jesus to fulfill our righteousness, to take our place as an atonement for our sin. So an atonement, if you don't know what that word means, it just means to cover or erase our sin, to turn God's wrath away from us. But he also came as fully God and fully man, which is so important to the Christian faith to show man what it looks like to be in right relationship with God. So he did come as fully man and walked out this life as fully man to show us what it looks like to walk in relationship with God. It was important that he did this as man because he was atoning for our sins, but he also had to do it fully as God because God is the only one that could save us. We can't save ourselves. So, okay, Jesus came, he walked out this life, he gained our righteousness back for us, he died on the cross, And then he rose again and restored us to right relationship with God. But how does that righteousness come into us? Let me read to you Romans chapter 3 verse 22. Let's see. Romans 3, 22. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. So all you have to do is have faith. Now remember my last video, as small as a mustard seed. And that is how this righteousness is restored to us. We are included in Jesus' life when we put our faith in him. And he sends us a helper to not do this on our own. We have the Holy Spirit when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and believe that he died on the cross and rose from the dead and has paid our sin debt. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell inside of us and the Holy Spirit is our helper. We can't do this life alone. And through that working, inner workings of the Holy Spirit, we start to see fruit of the Spirit in our lives from this obedience to the Lord, from this relationship being restored. You have now been justified just as if you never sinned. What I love about this, and this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, when you're saved, you are still capable of sin. But your sin nature is no longer there. Your nature has changed. So you are still capable of sin, but you no longer have that sin nature. And I love in 1 John, this scripture always, always comes to mind. It never fails. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Did you notice that verse 1 says, if anybody does sin? It doesn't say when you sin. Sometimes I think we live this life out expecting uh, ourselves to mess up. Now, Are we more than likely going to mess up? Yes, because we live in a fallen world. Temptation is all around us. The enemy is constantly knocking at our door. 
but we need to have faith in knowing that yes, if we sin, we have an advocate, but notice it says if, not when. Your sin nature has changed. Are we inevitably gonna fall? Probably, yes, we are. It's really tough for us, but I think it's so encouraging to know that we don't have to live by that sin nature anymore, that the Lord restored that. And now we are working through this process of becoming holy called sanctification. And in, I just shut my Bible. I don't know why I did this because I was going right back to Romans. It's in Romans 12 verse 2. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We are constantly in this process of renewing our minds every day. This is part of, not all of, but part of our sanctification process. That is why every morning when you wake up, it's important that you renew your mind. You renew your mind through the word. Um, you can't just expect to get in the word or spend time with God one day and then like be perfect. Um, it, that's why we do this. We do this to help ourselves, to guide us, but we also do it because we learn more about the character of God. And I was talking a little bit about how much God loves us. The only way you're truly going to know how much God loves you is if you read his word, learn about his character, learn about his love for you and what he did for you. I don't know how you could know how much God loves you and not just be like, wow, this is, this is what I was created for. This is why I'm here. He did all of these things. He, he did all these things through scripture, through the Old Testament. And still, we could not restore ourselves. Jesus Christ, his only son, had to come and die on a cross for our sins to be restored. He loved us that much. He would leave. Think about the, the scripture that talks about the shepherd who left the 99 for the one that got away. It doesn't matter if you were the only person in the world that ever did anything wrong. If you were the only person in the world that ever sinned, God would have done this all over again just for you, just for the one. You are so special to him. You are so loved by him. In this world, we get so caught up in wanting people's approval. We pe try to people please. We try to get people to love us when the greatest love of all is right there in front of us. So I say this today, don't let anybody scare you into salvation. I'm not trying to scare you into salvation and say, hey, you got to get out of the bad place and go to the good place. Hell is a place where wrath is given to sin. That is not, God does not send you to hell. I will never sit here and tell anybody like God's going to send you to hell. Hell is inevitably where you go because God has to be separated from sin. He cannot be in the presence of sin. But because of Jesus, because of the veil that was torn, let, let me talk to you about something else. Do you realize that in the Old Testament, you have Moses and Abraham. How do they have contact with God? How do they have relationship? It was much, much different than us. Priests in the Old Testament, it was dangerous for them. You had a tabernacle, and inside that tabernacle at the center, you had the Holy of Holies. And priests would go in with rope and a bell on their ankle. And if the bell stopped ringing, probably meant they were dead and they would have to get pulled out. I know that sounds awful, but if sin was present in the priest, if they had gone into the temple without providing a sacrifice for their sins to cleanse them before they entered, because that's how it was done in the Old Testament, we had to present a like blood offering, um, a clean offering to the Lord before we entered into his presence. When Jesus died on the cross for us, do you remember in scripture where it talks about the veil being torn? That means that there, this, this is not, that Jesus was the sacrifice one and for all for us. And so we get to have this relationship with the Lord. We get to be in his presence. So I'm not sitting here trying to tell you if you're not a Christian, this is why you should be. Like, you're going to go to hell if you're not. Heaven is a byproduct of salvation, and it is a wonderful one. But I'm telling you that there is nothing better than the love of God. There is nothing better than relationship with Him. And that doesn't mean that life's going to be perfect. That doesn't mean that you're going to walk through life without struggles and hardships. And like I said, the enemy, Satan, is jealous of you. He is so jealous because you have such a high place of honor in your father's court. You are a daughter of the one true king. You are a son of the one true king. And he loves you so much. The enemy is going to try to attack you from anything that you feel like a lot of times. For me, okay, example, it's my mind. He tries to make me feel insecure. He tries to make me feel, okay, insecure. That's just my word. It's going to cover a lot of things. He tries to make me feel that way. Um, he tries to make me feel like 
demeaned and like, I'm not worth anything. But God said you were worth it when he sent his son to die for you. Your relationship, just yours alone, was so worth it. So, okay, I'm going to stop there. But I hope that you can just feel the love of God today. And I just want to pray with you real quick. So, Lord, I just thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your gospel. God, I thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us, to atone for our sins, and to restore us with relationship with you. God, you love us so much that you went through so much to get us back. God, I just pray that your people hear you call them home. I pray that people's hearts are softened to your message, that their ears, their deaf ears would be open, their blind eyes would see again, Lord, that you love them, that you are good and you want good things for us. That God, this life is hard. Living in a sinful world is hard, but this world is not our home. You have made us for greater. You have made us for heaven. You have made us for yourself. God, I pray that you would just touch the hearts of those who hear this message today, Lord. I pray that your Holy Spirit would just convict hearts. But I also pray that more than anything, that people would just truly come to know your love. That people would be, just have this fire inside of them, this desire to know you more, to get to know your character, to pick up a Bible and to read more about you, Lord. Not because doing all of these things and doing all of this work gets us to heaven, but Lord, it is out of obedience that we do this. It is out of our yearning for our relationship with you to know you more, to love you more, to know more about you and how you feel about us, God. I pray that you would just wreck our hearts today, Lord, that you would draw us nearer to you. And God, I pray if there's anyone out there today, Lord, that wants to receive you into their heart, God, I pray that you would just be with them, Lord. All that you have to do to receive Jesus in your heart is to admit that you believe what he did for us. Say that you believe that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us, was raised from the dead. He atoned for our sins, um, that you have faith in him, that Jesus is the son of God. And God, I pray that you would just enter their hearts. God, that whatever prayer that they pray, Lord, that you would know their heart, that you would just be with them in this moment if they are accepting you into their heart today. God, I just thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that that is someone today. And if it's not, Lord, I pray that something that was said today, that some word that you had for somebody was received. God, I thank you so, so much for this opportunity to speak to people and for this opportunity to encourage and to love well. God, I pray that you would just be with us all throughout this week as we go into it and continue to speak to us and draw us near to you. It's in Christ's name I pray.